This is track 17, The Frame We Hold and What We Expect to See. Hey creatives, I'm C. Jordan Blacara, and welcome to the Whispering Worth to the World podcast. I'm a master certified life and artist coach who specializes in working with creatives. This is where I share what I would tell my younger self if I could, what I've learned about the art of being human, about our inherent divine equality, and how it all relates to navigating our creative expression in the world. So before we get started, I shall share a story of how capable we are of great things when we aim our creativity and innovation at creations that matter to us. Jimmy Carter, American president, recently celebrated his 99th birthday. He was asked about eight years or so ago what he would like to accomplish before he dies. And this is what he said. I want guinea worm to die before I do, which was an interesting statement. I had no idea what guinea worm was. And in 1986, this disease afflicted an estimated 3.5 million people a year in 21 countries in Africa and Asia. Since 1986, according to the Carter Center website, The Carter Center has led the international campaign to eradicate guinea worm disease, working closely with ministries of health and local communities, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and many others. So I will spare you the gory details, but suffice it to say that guinea worm is a disease that incapacitates people for extended periods of time, making them unable to care for themselves, work, grow food for their families or attend school. And it is contracted when people consume water from stagnant sources that are contaminated with guinea worm larvae. So on his 99th birthday, on October 1st, 2023, there were just six cases left in the world. And in large part, the eradication was created by bringing manual water filtration systems to the local people when they come to manually pump their water, and also by distributing drinking straws with built-in filters, which remove the larvae. Just six remaining cases as of October 1st, 2023. Guinea worm disease could become the second human disease in history after smallpox to be eradicated. It would be the first parasitic disease to be eradicated and the first disease to be eradicated without the use of a vaccine or medicine. This is all to show how much we are capable of, what great things we're capable of when we aim our creativity and our innovation at creations that matter to us and at bringing the seemingly impossible into manifestation. Okay. I found that story extremely inspiring, and I hope you do too. Now, moving on to today's episode, The Frame We Hold and What We Expect to See, I first want to tell you that I highly recommend the Book of Knowing and Worth, the Book of Knowing and Worth by Paul Selig, who is a channeler for an energetic body called The Guides. And in the book, one of their metaphors is the idea of the frame like a picture frame. And we are holding up this frame and viewing the world, all of the world, the infinite possibilities of the world. But when we hold up a frame, what we see is what we expect to see in the frame that we're holding. So when you have a painting in a frame, it holds what is seen in the painting, right? The pretty sky may be seen in a particular painting, but if the painting were 20 feet longer, you would see so much more. It limits, it says, I will only see this portion and I will dismiss the rest that is beyond the frame. So if we have had thoughts like, I have always believed such and such because that was our truth, our people's truth, our culture's truth, that is what is habituated and we continue to see that. So we are habituated to holding frames, so much so that we don't even see them as frames anymore. We more than likely see it as, quote unquote, the way things are, 
or, quote unquote, the way the world works, or, quote unquote, just how I am, when in actuality we are holding a frame. So when the Carter Center set about eradicating guinea worm disease in light of how much success they had, remember 3.5 million cases in 1986 to just six cases in 2023, we can imagine what frames they were not holding. The Carter Center would not be holding a frame where they expected to see this. It's not possible to eradicate a parasitic disease because it's never been done before. It's not possible to eradicate a disease without the use of a vaccine or medicine. We won't be able to get the cooperation of all the countries, governments, agencies that we need in order to accomplish this. This will take forever. Sure, we want to do this, but we don't know how. So it might not be possible. We won't be able to figure it out. No, when the Carter Center set the goal of eradicating the second disease in history after smallpox and set the goal of eradicating the first disease without the use of a vaccine or medicine, it became imperative to remove any frames that held a limiting view about those two things being possible. And when you release those limiting frames or frames like that, for example, we won't be able to figure it out, then you open up the playing field so that it is wide open and you have access to the full vistas, the full vista of possibilities. And you can just keep asking questions that will get you closer and closer and closer to your goal. Questions like, what could the next step be? What can we try next? How could we get cooperation from a variety of, of countries or agencies? How can we do this without a vaccine? What did we learn from the last step we took or the last thing we tried? How will it help us with our next step? So I'm going to elaborate on the desire to be myself from now on, which is from the last episode, and relate it to this idea of the frame. So I contemplated further on the idea of why I still wobble in being my meta self in a way that I no longer wobble in my distaste for alcohol, or as my nephews used to say when they were younger, ankle hall. (laughs) Um, And in a way that I no longer wobble with the random tears and emotions that well up for me. And while I continue to say random teariness, it's not quite random. I would say it happens when I feel here's my best language for it, moved or touched by an interaction with someone. And that someone could be anywhere on the spectrum from a seeming stranger all the way to a good friend. Or I might get that teariness when I feel connected to the human that is across from me. So I contemplated, why am I not allowing myself to be my full meta self, seeing the far view, the view from the level of the soul, spirit, the underlying energy, seeing unity rather than our separation from each other, seeing a new paradigm rather than the one that we all inherited, seeing from source energy, divinity, our eternal nature, and not only seeing it, but being willing to speak freely about it, to teach it, and to own my beliefs unapologetically. The question is, why am I not being myself already? That might be the question for you too. If you are not choosing to be your full self already, why am I choosing not to be my full self already? And for you, beautiful creative, if you're not fully being yourself already, why not? What is it that stands in the way? So being myself on the surface seems ideal. It seems amazing. It seems like the goal. But if I believed completely that everything would be rosy and wonderful and I would have the best life ever, if I was completely being myself, then I would be being myself completely right now. If there was nothing anywhere in my consciousness that I was aligned to that coheres with hiding or dimming or diminishing parts of myself, then there would be no conflict. I would be me fully expressed all day, every day. For example, I think it's a pretty good idea not to touch a hot stove. And so I don't touch hot stoves. I think it's a good idea to wear a seatbelt and lock my car doors when I leave my car. So I wear a seatbelt and I lock my car doors when I leave the car. No questions, no fight, no resistance to touching hot stoves, wearing a seatbelt or locking my car doors. But 
I hold reservations and concerns that preclude me from allowing myself to be myself entirely. Can you relate? So what are the concerns or beliefs that give me pause and cause me to blink back as I did with the teary, watery eyes years and years ago? Certain parts of myself to contain, suppress, dim, hide, turn down the volume on my full self. Here's what I've come up with. Three things, three main things, serious enough to give me serious consideration when I consider being myself fully. First, evisceration. And I found it so important that that was the first topic of the first podcast because I had to meet my ideas of evisceration before I brought my podcast out into the world. So evisceration, I will be eviscerated physically. Another way of speaking about this is safety. If you can eviscerate me physically, my physical safety is at risk, maybe even my life. And I think that's a fair concern. That's normal. That's understandable. That if I believe my physical safety is at risk or vulnerable to attack or harm, I may draw back. Who can fault anyone for having a concern for their own personal physical well-being? Let me mention horses. When you encounter a horse or a herd of horses, the first concern for a horse is safety. Normally, if you're driving by, you see them in pastures and fields and whatnot, right? They're completely unconcerned and they're just grazing and they're chilling. But when there is a threat in the environment, a bobcat, the sound off in the distance, some perceived threat, the first order of business for the entire herd is safety. If their safety is at risk and they need to respond or react, they will do so. Everything else is put on pause until safety is addressed. And once they are assured that their safety is not at risk, they will return to their essential beingness, grazing, hanging out, just being. In general, and in under normal circumstances, horses will not hold the memory and carry it forward. Once their safety is reestablished, they let it go. They will not say, I was concerned or afraid on a Friday, and so I will be ever on alert on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and forevermore. But that is what, as humans, we might do if there is a threat. If we were harmed, if we suffered danger, threat, trespass, we say, I was harmed on a Friday, and then we pick up and design a frame, a picture frame, and then we conclude I will see through this picture frame a threat on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and evermore. I now have a frame, and when I look through that picture frame, I will get the picture of threat that I expect to see in that frame. And then we walk through the world getting what we expect to see until we put down the picture frame or change what we expect to see. And we might be carrying many frames what are some of your frames and what do you expect to see? I cannot be an artist. I am the one who would not be accepted if I painted what I really wanted to paint. I expect to be the starving artist. I am the misunderstood artist. I cannot be loved as I am. I am the outsider who will never belong. Those might be frames that you carry. What are the frames? It's important to see the frames that we carry because if we can't even see that we are carrying the frame, we don't have the option and the choice of putting it down if we don't even see that we're carrying it. So basic safety, back to safety. Will I be physically harmed if I fully express myself? If you are offended, what might you do to me? If you are threatened by what I say or propose or suggest, what might you do to me? Will you bully me? Will you plot to harm me? So one of the main reasons I may draw back from my full expression is the fear of, number one, evisceration, being physically harmed. A second reason is isolation. I would call this a form of emotional and psychological evisceration. Cultures... Communities have practiced this form of emotional evisceration by isolating someone, leaving someone alone, stranded, ostracized, banned, banished. 
in the animal kingdom, this can prove to be a very physical threat to be isolated. A horse is part of a herd, but they are more apt to be dinner for a predator when they are alone versus when they are with the herd. What a lion does, we've seen it, right? In the documentaries, when they go after an animal in a pack, herd or group is to pick one animal off from the herd, off from the group, so that they can dominate that one animal and have dinner. Hyenas, hyena packs will work together to take down a lion, to take down a bigger predator, a more formidable predator that they could not take down if they were alone. So they'll work in packs. So like the animal world, our very survival may require working with others to help in providing for our own sustenance or shelter. The newborn baby, human baby, needs a caretaker, needs to be assisted by the larger tribe of their parent or parents, a caregiver, or some kind of tribe of people that will assist them. My mother needed a tribe around her, which included me, in order to care for her when she had Alzheimer's. In the non-human world, she would have perished much earlier in the progression of her disease, of a disease that debilitates her in the way that Alzheimer's did, because she would not have known how to care for herself on her own. So if you are separated from the pack or you don't have a pack, your quality of life may be diminished, threatened, or extinguished. And that's from a purely physical survival point of view. What about the fact that we are hardwired as humans for communication, connection, belonging. If I show a part of myself that might be unacceptable to you or unlikable to you or unlovable to you, you may leave me alone, spurn me, cast me aside. I may be left alone by you specifically, or I may be ousted by the group, maybe a group I hold dear. I may be kept out of the club. You may not give me the password to the Friday night speakeasy. You may cluster in your group and giggle and laugh and cast a glance in my way, seemingly depriving me of connection and belonging. So let's put that connection and belonging in the primal category with a concern for our physical safety. Because if you deprive me, if I'm deprived of connection and belonging, I am being deprived of emotional and psychological safety. If you dislike me, or my ideas, or find me or my ideas unacceptable in some way, will you cast aspersions on my reputation? Will you become a hater? Will you freeze me out, stop talking to me, disown me, ghost me? Will you slander, libel, defame, or seek to cancel me? Will you make life difficult for me? What will you do to affect my future, my opportunities, how others see me? If me being in full expression in my full autonomy might be the reason you would isolate me, then I may think twice about being fully expressed or being myself for a day, let alone being myself from now on. Will an artist allow themselves to do a series about their feelings of loneliness, or would that be too personal, too revealing, too vulnerable, too scary? Can they allow those feelings to be seen or exposed? Do they worry that they wouldn't be accepted for that? Will they be seen as weak, worthy of pity, pathetic? Will others laugh or question their mental health? Will others look down on them? Or is there any kind of creation that you would pour yourself into like Jimmy Carter in the guinea worm, but if you poured yourself into it and it didn't go well for you, and people laughed or it wasn't a success, do you fear that that might isolate you in some way or threaten your connection and belonging to the communities or the people or the one person that you hold dear? So for me, if I am too woo-woo or meta or out there, no one will come do my programs. The artists will say, nope, too weird, tap out. The potential clients will say, hmm, not enough science and data for me. I need something a bit more evidence-based. I want you to coach me, Jordan, on the how and what I need to do, the hard skills, not the soft skills. Give me a step-by-step plan, hold me accountable, and I'll follow it. People that I could help, that I would love to help, might say, no, hard pass, Jordan. Jordan is too out there for me. She is irrelevant because no science, no evidence, too ephemeral or esoteric, too much talk of sufficiency and worth and divinity and spirituality. 
And it doesn't matter how much proof there is in the world for how people might come and connect with us when we hold a frame. For example, the clients that have showed up in the artist programs that I co-facilitate have been a varied bunch from engineers turned artists to occupational therapists turned artists to art school graduates returning to their creativity who became marketing execs. And sometimes they are therapists and counselors. So artists come from a variety of backgrounds. My clients have included Reiki practitioners, acupuncturists, people of the spiritual persuasion, feminists, energy people, seekers. That could give me a lot of reason to think that I can totally be myself. But if I hold a frame of fear, of evisceration and isolation, I will still not feel free to speak openly and be myself. I could probably be my full self and still get by, but in holding the frame and expecting to see the threat of evisceration and isolation, I will blink back about 30% just in case. I will keep that 30% on the down low. So one main reason to not be ourselves from now on, or even for a day, is evisceration. Threat of physical evisceration, pain, and suffering. Two, isolation. Threat of emotional or psychological evisceration by being isolated, cast out by the threat to our connection and belonging to a tribe, family, or community. And the third main reason, especially for someone seeking to make a living from their art is the threat of poverty or perishing by not being able to provide for yourself, which is another threat to one's physical safety. It's a form of evisceration. If I am myself, can I still pay the bills? Will there be someone who will hire me? Will I be employable? If I'm banished or cast out, then I won't fit into a company. Or if I'm an artist, there may be no people to purchase or consume or appreciate my creations, whatever they are, paintings, sculptures, songs, scripts. If my art or creations do not pay the bills, am I willing to pay the bills in a different way and not require my art to make my living for me? Are you willing to make a commitment to your art like Elizabeth Gilbert, the writer of Eat, Pray, Love? What she did is she vowed to her creativity that her creativity would never have to pay the oil bill, as she put it. You may feel that making an income to pay the bills precludes you from being your full self. You may hold that frame. So when I am not in my full expression at the core, my greatest fears are one, being eviscerated, which is a threat to physical safety, two, being isolated, which is a threat to my emotional safety and can lead to physical lack of safety, and not being able to provide for myself or perishing in potential poverty, which is also a threat to my physical safety and my ability to provide for food and shelter, which are a primal safety concern. Now, there have been people who accept that evisceration or isolation or perishing in poverty could happen and they proceed anyway. Not perhaps without trepidation, prudence, awareness, or concern, but they proceed anyway. Think about people who join the military and put their lives on the line for something larger than themselves. Think about Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi, who likely knew that assassination was at least a possibility. Think about Harriet Tubman, who, once she escaped slavery, made at least 13 trips back into slaveholding territories to lead about 70 others to freedom. There was a high bounty on her head, and she said, there was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. There's the political landscape. Just being a poll worker these days might bring on some heat. The gay child in the highly intolerant family who dares reveal their true sexuality and risks being ostracized from the people they hold most dear. So now to my own frames. I realized I have been holding a frame and expecting to see a certain picture. And my frame is if I speak out and express all of me, I may be eviscerated, isolated, or wind up perishing in poverty. And I expect to see that. 
in that frame. As I shared in the last episode, number 16, being yourself from now on, I used the image of being on a party boat filled with people in the middle of a sea. And if I was my whole self, the captain would find an island, they'd pull up to the island in the middle of the ocean, and they would say, get off the boat, and they'd leave me on the island alone, left to perish, left alone and isolated to basically die a slow death (laughs) or figure out how to survive out there on that island in the middle of the ocean. And at last, I saw that frame. I saw it for what it was. I could see clearly that I was looking through a frame and have been for a very long time, the frame through which I expect to see this picture. If I speak out, express all of me, I may be eviscerated or isolated or perish from poverty. I saw that when I saw the party boat and being kicked off the party boat and being left isolated on an island in the middle of the ocean with no civilization seen off in the distance pure horizon line all around that I was holding the picture frame and seeing the picture I expected to see. And here's what I did. I began to imagine the frame dissipating, releasing. I also imagined that the frame suspended in front of me vertically began to split at all of the corners and just expanded outward until it was gone from view. As soon as I did that, essentially removing the frame in those two ways, either by it just gently becoming invisible and dissipating or by it splitting apart and moving out of view, here's what happened. Here's the vision that came to me. A boat came to the island that I was left on and a person gets kicked off that boat and I am no longer alone. And I realized that I could not even conceive of this possibility. I never even considered it when I was looking through my original frame. I never considered that somehow, some way, I might not be alone. I never entertained that others might be kicked off too and that we might have something in common or they might land on the same island somehow. We might understand each other. We might commune with each other. We might even befriend one another or at least somehow share a life on this island. And while we may not agree on everything, we might look at one another and say, hello, friend. I see you and you're right to be. I have no qualms with you. And then another vision. Quickly, another boat comes and a second person gets kicked off that boat. And now there are these two other people on the island with me. There we are, the three of us. Almost in an instant of releasing the frame, I was looking through a new possibility presented itself in my mind. What a miracle. And as the Course in Miracles says, a miracle is a shift in perception. And the shifts are now happening rapidly for me as I have released the frame. All of a sudden, I am not alone. And there is a new possibility. And then I realize I have two dear friends Where? In real life. Now we are not in an image. We are in my reality, my real life. When I let myself be myself with these friends, in my totality with them, I am seen, I am heard, I am welcomed, encouraged, supported, empathized with, given compassion. And I realize I have been in my fullest expression with these two humans in my life for many years. And I have not been alone all this time. I have found two kindred spirits. I have been walking with two kindred spirits. I have not been isolated. Without the isolation frame, I can see that I am not currently isolated. And I have not been for many years. There are at least two people with me here on this quote unquote island. Could there be more? And as I ponder this, a hummingbird lands on a branch outside my window to signal that, yes, there are more. I have been keeping a steady eye on who might eviscerate or isolate me and how I might perish by being my full self, which has kept me from fully appreciating and enjoying two very distinct humans who have walked steadily with me for years. Seeing the whole ocean, the whole scene without the frame, the vista opens up. So now, back to 
my improv, with my unconscious mind. And now what happens in my vision? A third boat arrives at the island and the three of us on the island watch this boat and one person gets off the boat. And the three of us are expecting for the boat to sail off. But what happens is the whole boatload of people gets off, including the captain. And my mind is blown. Yes, this is a possibility that they have come. This island was a destination for other boats and boatloads of people. Whether they're kicking off a single person or they're all coming to the island for this destination. And what happens on the island? There amongst all of us, instant party. Without the frame, I can now see what could not be seen. I am in a new possibility, just as possible as physical evisceration, just as possible as isolation, banishment, separation from the tribe, is a new tribe, a new community, a new group of people who meet me on the island and we join in celebration. Yes, Martin Luther King Jr. did his work and knew he might be assassinated and boatloads of people came and change was made. Yes, Gandhi did his work and knew he might be assassinated and boatloads of people came and change was made. Yes, Harriet Tubman faced sure evisceration if captured and she helped free boatloads of people and change was made. And all of the others who comprised the Underground Railroad also faced evisceration and they moved forward and change was made. Yes, the soldier... Sailor, Marine, paratrooper, or pilot may lose their life and they accepted the risk and their life stood for something larger, for a larger mission than their own personal safety or connection. Their life was offered in service to a greater cause. Yes, the gay child speaks their truth and risks abandonment from their nuclear family and while some are embraced. Unfortunately, others pay the price of isolation and evisceration and perhaps find a new tribe. But the risk, while sometimes painful, can also be worth taking the brave and courageous action for because that gay child wanted to be themselves from now on. Yes, the poll worker surmounts her worry, concerns, and fears and chooses the brave action and volunteers to support democracy on election day, as I have. I now see that I have been carrying a frame and the picture I expected to see in that frame was a world where being myself fully was a threatening proposition. So in carrying that frame, the Google search engine of my mind has scanned and located and returned search results that confirmed for me what I expected to see. And when I set down the frame or let it evaporate or break apart, I saw a different view. And always, 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 I do not know my life curriculum. I don't know what it will be until it is here. I did not know that it called me to the career of a life coach for artists and creatives. I did not know it called me to the journey of Alzheimer's with my mother. I did not know that my life would call me to live in the times of a pandemic, like you, if you're probably listening. I did not know it would call me to attend to the worth of my fellows. When I release the frame that I have been holding, I can see a different view. I can consider being willing to be kicked off the party boat and left on the island. I can consider that I may not be there alone for long. I can consider that others may come. We may find each other and we may have a great gathering indeed. I do not know what my soul is calling to me. That is an unfolding. But if ever I was left completely alone on the island, I might consider it was worth it to say what I want to say, to be how I want to be, to choose what I want to choose, to be myself, if just for a day, to be myself. When I sit down the frame, I see that I can move forward in the unknown, in the not knowing. In fact, I participate in creating a new known. I can embark on a new journey where new things are possible that never could be with the frame that I held formerly. It just wouldn't be possible. So now I'm going to offer you a short visualization. And I would recommend that you are in some place quiet, some place maybe that you can be seated in a comfortable chair or laying down. I wouldn't recommend that you are driving. Operating heavy, 
operating heavy machinery, as they say. Okay. So you could save this part of today's podcast for when you can be in that quiet, reclined, relaxed place. So here we go. Identify a frame that you hold. Perhaps a frame where you are afraid to be yourself fully. Take a moment, push pause on this podcast if necessary to call up a frame that you have been holding that limits your view. When you hold this frame, you cannot see the full view. I cannot be the artist I want to be. I will not be accepted if I paint what I want to paint. I am the one who is never appreciated. I am the one who is not allowed. So now, having identified the frame, see the frame. See the actual frame and see the view that you see within that frame. That view that you expect to see. See the border of the frame, the literal picture frame that you have conjured. Now imagine releasing the frame, push it out, splitting at the corners, separating, expanding out until it moves past your view, past your entire peripheral vision. Or seeing the border of the frame, let it dissipate, slowly evaporating into thin air. If you wish, you can burn it or hurl it into the far reaches of the galaxy. However you imagine it, you are releasing the frame entirely. And now that that frame that once was and no longer is, now see the view that you can see. See the new view. See with new eyes, with new sight. Look at the full vista now that the view has changed. Imagine the new possibilities. Survey what you see now. Now that you can see the expanse, the full view unencumbered, what is now visible? See the new horizon line. See the expansive view. And seeing these new possibilities, you say yes. Feeling the expansion now, feeling this freedom now, feeling this possibility now. Imagine living into this new way of being. Imagine living in this new expanded world. What new choices are now possible? What would you like to bring into existence? You are now the creator of the new known. Hey, creatives. I will have future classes and trainings on the self-worth of the soul, as well as stepping outside of the entire paradigm most of us don't even know we're trapped in, so that we can live and create with more innovation, invention, and infinite choice. Want to know more? Go to www.createanyway.today forward slash soul, S-O-U-L. That's createanyway.today forward slash soul. Soul.